Hey guys, Bob Geary here, Ancient Reproductions. It's been quite a while since I've uh, talked to you on video and uh, I apologize for that. I wanna keep helping and keep uh, sharing nuggets uh, from my experience. Today is a big one. Uh, I really wanna start talking about feeding. Feeding is one of those things that to me, an experienced keeper that has really, really done a lot of trials and pushed the limits to extreme levels in many different directions. It's a very complex subject. But I find that most keepers, and, and it's well intended, tend to look at it very narrowly. There's one kind of feeding, you gently increase, you don't want to go bigger than the size of the thing's body, you know, whatever, you, you want to feed huge food items. You want to intersperse what you think are natural food items into a completely unnatural environment. But you guys think that's cool. Um, and I applaud you for that. Uh, knowledge we need a lot of different strategies i think when we take care of reptiles because your reptile is not the same right you know i recently uh lost uh, my oldest argentine boa at 28 plus i can't remember the months but about 28 and a half i think now that's an animal that's gone through a tremendous just to use him as an example he was a male i bought him in the early 90s um so he had a baby life he had a juvenile life he had a a uh, sub-adult life, uh, diet, think that way, right, and work routine, he had an adult life. Now, in his adult life, he worked his tail off. He was a breeder for probably, off the cuff of my head, 13 seasons, easy-ish, um, you know, used here and there, but worked and worked and worked. And what that means is for half of the year was with females constantly breeding, defending, being territorial, and having that metabolic rate way up, um, in my opinion. So there are a tremendous amount of different reasons why we feed differently. Male, female, breeding, not breeding, cool season, uh, warm season, intermediate season. You want to hold them. You want to save money and slow down. You have a bigger enclosure. Let's go bigger. You have a smaller enclosure. Let's stay more conservative. There's a million different uh, approaches. I think all of them have their place. Um, it's just that I want you to consider that, you know, if you feed heavy, you're not going to hell and your snake's not instantaneously going to get fat. Please just be more open-minded in that when somebody with a lot of experience is talking to you, they are thinking through a different lens. And that is one where they know the animals go through so many different conditions and stages that different strategies work for different times. Okay. So this is, as it always is, a zero judgment environment, um, but one where we aggressively ask questions and try to be really honest. Um, and, and let me just be honest. Um, I came, and this is very important to put into perspective for everything I tell you. I, I really don't want to give you how-tos. I don't want you to come away with a recipe. I want you to be stimulated to think and possibly apply a philosophy to your keeping. Now, I've only worked with like 12 species pretty intensely um, uh, or produced them, which for me is working with them usually pretty intensely for a number of years. Um, You know, you guys, I realize, don't have that experience, number one. And number two, that's only 12 species out of thousands, right? Um, my experience lies in boas and pythons. I've done a couple of venomous snakes, too. I've done arboreal stuff. I've done gaboons, were my crazy passion, uh, cobras. So I've had a good mix. And that's why I don't want to give anybody any recipe, because sure enough, the person that hears my video will not be caring for the exact snake I was and something could get misinterpreted and i don't want anything or anyone or any animal to be hurt so always take it into context and what i'm going to try to give you are tools for your toolbox that you can apply to uh, any captive um, to try to do whatever it is you want because remember these are poikilothermic animals these are highly flexible animals and that's something i think that people don't grab onto with reptiles enough and and in captivity is you Oftentimes, a younger keeper will, will raise X thing, let's say boas, because I'm, you know, doing boas now, obviously, and, uh, or have men, but anyway, um, and 
you know, they'll have one boa and they'll raise it one way and they'll think that's the one way to raise boas, especially if they get a great result, right? The animal turns out, and, you know, wow, it's X size, it says this and this, says that. But what I'll just try to give you as a flip side is what do you know about the options you didn't try? Nothing. So there's a tremendous amount of different options. Just to, just to elicit that or show the variation in the conditions that drive how I think any information that I'll give you is, you know, in Argentine boa, I've had those produce uh, from a size of 12 pounds for their first litter as a female on up to about 55 pounds. Um, ages ranging in five to 21 solid. I've had litters. I need to refer to that. I might have a 22 or 23 year old. Um, and, uh, body weights again, 12 to 55, almost 60 pounds, about 55 is a limit. I think that I really wanted to go, but, uh, so that's a tremendous amount of variation, right? A 20 year old female is phenomenally different than a, a six year old female, although they're both adult females. Um, so here we go. Video number one with that in mind is one of the things that I found myself using lately to get two-year-old Argentine boas growing was kind of a technique that I've just developed through observation, uh, which is kind of, a, I don't really name it, but uh, kind of my metabolic feeding technique, my metabolic increasing technique, and that is to take a snake that, and again, this is very general, I'm not showing you snakes, I'm not giving you numbers and food items, but to feed the snake smaller food items much more frequently in an effort to get the metabolism moving and steadily rising and up to a point where you've got the metabolism up quite high. Um, now, you don't have to do that. There's all, oh, again, the range of variation here is amazing. Um, this is a technique that I've used to grow snakes very aggressively that I frankly probably tripped into. Didn't elaborate on that before. Um, when we were trying everything under the sun because we knew nothing. I, I don't think I barely know much now, but how you get to places of knowledge and accomplishment in reptiles when we started in the 80s was trying stuff that you had no idea if it was going to work. You, I mean, I literally bought extra animals in my founder groups because I figured I would kill some because I was so clueless I was going to have to give these animals uh, some conditions, some at different extremes and some in the middle. And, you know, I was really honest with myself and we had an opportunity to learn great things or get our butt kicked. And we got a little bit of both, um, which is fine because that teaches you much quicker, you know, how to take better care of the animal or at least get to where you think you want to go. So anyway, uh, back to metabolism. And just one other quick thing. I do want to say that you know, we only know what we know when we know it. By no means am I professing that this is the technique, the only way. Never, never will I say that with anything I do because, for instance, because the techniques that we employ, let's say as boa constrictor breeders, you know, we're really applying to not that many snakes in any given person's lifetime. There's a few people in the United States probably only that have enough numbers to generate any data that's got any scientific reliability at all, but that doesn't really matter. The data that matters is what you generate in your place, in your conditions for your animals. That's what really matters, not what I do. Um, so here's the technique or the thinking is regarding metabolism is feeding technique that I've used to really get the metabolism up. Now, I think when you get the metabolism up, what you do is you have the potential to consume more food more efficiently, and that food is put to growth instead of fat reserve. And so therefore, what I believe you get out of that is a leaner, is some fantastic, is, is potentially explosive growth, uh, but a leaner snake because the animal is putting so much into growing. Um, I will contrast that and I'll show you a little visual aid here with the technique that people employ because it seems to be a more natural one as far as looking at what might happen in a natural environment and that's to feed a large item less frequently, okay? large item less frequently. So here's our, so that, what I'm talking about is feeding a smaller item, not small, but a smaller item. Again, a lot of gradation there or interpretation more frequently. When I say more frequently, you know, these days with the boas, I'm probably at about 
five days. I'm not hard or firm on that day. Uh, honestly, when I see them digesting down to a certain point, I'll feed them. Um, it can be five to seven days, all depending on the size of the item and the heat and the rate of digestion and everything. But the goal is, what I would do is, I would not feed them any with a greater interval than seven days. I would try to get it five, six-ish. Uh, something I like to see is them defecating in between being fed, which I like to see. I just don't want to pack a snake and cause stress and do all that. There's nothing to be gained there. Um, what I am trying to do is put on lean, healthy growth. So let me give you an idea of why I developed that taking care. Let me just give you a visual aid behind um, <clears throat> how I look at the food thing. So here we go. I hope you can see this. Here we have my kind of high metabolic technique here, which is really sort of focusing on a, uh, a mild feed and you see the metabolism kind of go up and go down and it just travels that short little distance right there, right? So uh, now we have really is what I look at is feeding a larger meal system, right? There's a percent of deviation off rest. Here's mine, roughly percent, you know, this is just spitball stuff. So what you see here is low metabolism or more at rest, eat the food item, metabolism cranks up. Let's say you're feeding a large food item like, you know, a large constrictor would in the wild, sits on it for a long time, digests, metabolism slowly decreases back down to that resting rate. Because some of you guys, you know, are feeding once a month, once every two months. Some of you guys maintain, you know, again, I've just heard a lot of different stuff and I've tried a lot of different stuff. And so here's mine on top right and so the way i look at it is the straightest uh, way i look at it is to get from here to here is time and is going to require a certain amount of food to get your animal from where it is here to where it is who knows where here not here this is just one meal but however far off into the distance you want to grow a certain amount you want to gain a certain amount of weight uh, you just want to condition, you want to get to X point, whatever that is, there's a certain amount of food that animal has to consume, right? So I look at it as, uh, well, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I look at it as there's a certain distance I have to travel and what's the most efficient way to travel. So in a really dummy sense, let me just turn it this way. And so if this was, if you were on a path and you wanted to get to the place as quick as possible, would you want this path? Or would you want this path? I like this one myself. And imagine this repeated 30 times or 20 times. This is going to be repeated maybe 40 times. Um, but it's a concept to look at. And what I think this does is it jacks up the metabolism of the animal to where it's operating at a much more efficient uh, rate and can assimilate nutrients and food much more effectively. And so you just get good lean growth. You don't get a fat snake. Now, there's lots of caveats to that with boa constrictors, with big snakes and age, growth potential, seasonality. There are limitless variations here. But I think that the general concept is, you know, worth applying maybe something you're trying. It all depends. I can use that to get growth. I use that technique to uh, for raw growth in a young animal. I use that technique, let's say, um, I used it this year coming out of spring or coming out of the cool time to try to transition to that more warm feeding. Um, you know, just every little bit. I was really trying to get some size on, and we are. We're getting fantastic size on some of our two-year-olds. Um, and we use this technique on everything. We, we and, 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 you know, I just want to close with, you will hear me uh, make some comments uh, that are completely honest, citing incredible growth and incredible weight gain and uh, some numbers and stuff that you guys probably think is ridiculous or I'm lying or I'm just stupid. I don't know. Ridiculous. Who cares? Uh, but what I need you guys to understand is back when I started, there wasn't anyone... You know, there was, again, you've heard this a lot, and I don't mean to sound like an ogre, but the breadth of the information just wasn't there. So my whole technique was, I remember I used to go out and ask people, I've probably said this before in video, I know I have, uh, you know, gosh, what's your, you know, what's your one thing that you think is, you know, key to your success in boas? Or I was asking them something pretty, pretty specific, I think, seasonality and cycling. 
And they all gave me completely different answers. They all came from completely different points of view. And I think they were probably all correct. Um, and I probably wasn't smart enough to understand it. But they had all focused on a certain portion of their management. Um, very difficult. So it's very difficult for two reptile people to talk and be eye to eye in a specific sense. But in a general sense, like feeding concepts and, you know, gosh, how long have you cooled your, you know, colubrid for and maybe some other general stuff and body weights at work. You know, a lot of times we can talk and I think gain a lot from each other. So I hope that's a little strategy that you might employ feeding more often uh, food items that are probably in most snakes as big or the bot of the body or slightly larger. Um, and again, play with that. Uh, after you get that animal, you will see, uh, after you get that meta animal's metabolism rocking and rolling, it will consume food much faster. Um, so you need to increase the size of the food item probably faster than you are normally accustomed to in order to maintain the same ratio of the weight of that food item to your snake. So what happens sometimes really quickly is that people feed themselves kind of into a, a, a pause and that they uh, end up feeding themselves into a decrease in that the food item continues to get smaller in relation to the snake. And so when you're feeding very frequently, all of a sudden the food item percentage of body weight is going and, you know, you need to be aware of that and uh, keep that percentage of body weight up. And at a similar, I would recommend that at a similar or greater level, uh, or else you are likely to suffer, you know, metabolic downturn because animals not having to work as hard. But it's a really interesting way, I think, to get the metabolism up so that you're efficient and you avoid a fat snake. So anyway, I hope that's of some use. I know I've gone on quite a bit, but I think this food topic is huge. Um, it's probably the most, uh, one of the most important things I can talk to you guys about. And, you know, I just want to uh, give you all the benefit of all my, frankly, all my failures and struggles. And, you know, in the hopes that uh, you guys do the best you can. Great to talk to you again. Uh, please comment. I will be back probably very shortly with uh, video number two on feeding and we'll just look at some other aspect and uh, go from there. Take care.